All right, well, welcome to another episode of Perspective. I'm here with uh, James. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot your name. <laughs> That's all right. James Strong, <laughs> all the way in Sydney, Australia. I, I forgot to ask yeah. you, what time is it over there? Uh, it's actually 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, morning, like so 10 far. p.m.? Yeah. Like at night? Uh, 10 a.m. Oh, 10 a.m. Okay. Are you on? Yeah, yeah. Is it Tuesday over there? Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. So a little bit ahead of the day. Yeah. All right. You're ready, like catching up on whatever's happening on Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, man. So I've actually been able to connect with James uh, actually, um, over uh, Twitter, I think. Twitter. Just, just social yeah, mainly media. Twitter. Yeah. And yeah, just really been enjoying the content he's putting out a lot. He's been putting out a lot of, you know, just positive content, like just good, uplifting content that I've really been enjoying. Uh, but man, can you actually just introduce yourself and you know, let everyone know what you're up to, what you're doing? Uh, yeah, sure. So my name is James, um, obviously from Sydney, Australia. Um, if you guys are listening from the US or anywhere else. Um, so basically, I just started doing like the social media stuff. Um, I was working in retail before. And, um, I, where do I start? <laughs> Been through like quite a lot of things. Um, but probably the most recent thing was like about like five years ago, I went through like a whole, like a, um, skin detox condition. So basically something called, um, topical steroid withdrawal. Uh, you know, like for some reason, I'm not too sure why, but a lot of like Asian people have like what's called eczema when they're growing up. And, um, when they get to, I think, what kind of tends to happen is that um, you start to use what's called topical steroids. It's kind of like the um, kind of like the the normal thing that they give you over the counter. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, what happened was I was using that for like a couple of years, like probably like 20, 22 years, and then um, the body kind of got like used to it, almost like addicted to that that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I basically, went cold turkey. Like so, I was like one day I was just like, all right, it's not getting better. I'm just gonna stop completely and then um my body went into a complete like relapse for about like five years um like skin would shed like every day for like three years i mean uh, three times a day and it was pretty bad like but over the course of five years it got like a lot better like just progressively and um one of the one of the main things i wanted to do was that i wanted to share some of the experiences that i had from that um and some of like the mental perspective that i had like going through that with with people um as well as a lot of other different things that i was involved in um but yeah that's what led to like doing some of the content online um and obviously going to like garage selling stuff like that because i wanted to make some money on the side um but yeah like that's where we're at Dude, that's 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 intense man <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. so uh wow i did not know that about you oh really <laughs> I haven't really so, much about it, actually. Yeah, that, that's so that's so interesting. So what? So you say it took about five years to yeah. I guess goodbye to to recover from all that. Yeah. Um. So are you are you good now? Like, do you still have to take anything? Yeah, yeah. Or no, no, no. It's pretty good now. So like, just use like some moisturizer and stuff like that, just to kind of like balance it, but not as much as I used to. It used to be like a daily thing where you have to like put on like a lot of cream like every day. Mm -hmm. Um. But especially when I was going through the the actual detox process um it was it was pretty bad like i think for the first six months i couldn't do anything i like, basically had to stay at home oh wow which is yeah interesting experience <laughs> yeah. so i'm curious because i mean you talked about you know wanting to share you know like i guess the mindset of what, what you were going through when you were going through all that um yeah what i mean what what was going through your mind like during, during this whole time um that's a good question, actually. Uh, I think there was always annoyingness that it would get better because there was um, this is basically a group. Um, like, so before I actually started doing actually like research, like other other people that are doing stuff like that. Um, there's a group called Itsan that's online, and they're basically other people that have kind of gone through the same process, um, and they do talk about like it being a very long. Usually takes like two, three, four, five years to actually go through, um, which is a pretty big pretty big commitment like knowing what it looks like and what it's going to be um going into that so there was always a knowingness that it was going to be better like you know things always get better and stuff like that but uh, in the day-to-day -day, man this is like it's really a day-by-day -day process where you you have to um just kind of 
be on point every single day. And, you know, obviously, like, not all days are going to be the best. You know, some days you're just going to, like, lose it. But, you know, it is what it is. And I think if you just have the bigger picture in mind, that it, it allows you to handle the day-to-day stuff a lot better because you just know that that's where you're going. And there's always going to be ups and downs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you mentioned how, how you know, uh, you had rough, I guess, what am I trying to ask? Actually, I, I don't want to ask that. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I guess from, from all that, like, were there days that, that you were just like, man, screw this, this sucks, like. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah. So, um, actually, funny. Um, so like the first month, I thought I would be like, I was a little bit naive, so I thought I would, I thought I would like kind of get over it in a month. Mm-hmm. So I actually went to the, I actually went to the States. Um, so I went to, uh, I went on a cruise in Florida to, my, to the Bahamas, and it just kind of like escalated while I was there. Mm-hmm. So, we ended up going to this place called Coco Cay Beach, which is like a really like secluded beach off of uh, somewhere in like the the archipelago there or something like that. Um, it's where like all the cruise ships go. They dock there. They usually um, it's kind of because it's just a really small island that they stay there for the day, and then people go like, you know, they go enjoy like what it's like to be in the Bahamas and whatnot with like no other people around. Um, but yeah, I was there like, and this was kind of like at the height of when it was really escalating. And I couldn't actually get into the water because the salt water actually burnt my skin to the point where it felt like fire. And so I was in like this, this like beautiful like setting of like being on the beach. It's like nice sunny summer day and I couldn't even get in the water. And it was like, that's when it like really hit me like, Oh shit. Like, you know, um, your health is really something that's really important that you, you kind of take for granted until you get to that point where you don't really realize like how important it is. And even though I was in that almost like environment, which, which a lot of people kind of like, you know, like a lot of people's dreams is to kind of just like lay on the beach and like, you know, just enjoy, you know, being in a really nice place that even though I was there, I still couldn't enjoy that to that, to that level because of that, um, I guess that health thing. So that was a really interesting, interesting wake up call that I had when I was there. So from that experience, I, what, what shifts did you start making? Like, with, cause you said you started realizing that, you know, health was important and everything. So what shifts did you start making after that? Um, so I got more into, I got more into juicing. So like drinking a lot of juice was a really big thing. Um, it really helped and I had to change my diet a little bit. Um, but a lot of it really comes down to a lot of it really comes down to, to your mindset and like your perspective, like obviously the title of this thing. But um, it really comes down to your attitude and how you're going to take things. Because I think without the right attitude, it's very easy to fall into like depression and, you know, just like feeling like completely negative and really getting like, you just get into like these really, like really bad zones. Um, and to kind of work yourself out of that uh, is, is kind of, is a process. It's a process, uh, especially every day. So I think that part is really, really important. So was it, uh, was it after that experience that you started working more on your mindset or when did that, um, start becoming important to you? Uh, actually that started about like 10 years ago. So a decade ago I was in, um, I think I was in uni and then, uh, I actually kind of dropped out of uni. So, um, I grew up in a pretty, pretty sheltered life, you know, like it wasn't bad. It was like middle class, but, um, uh, you know, my parents were really, really nice people and they, they kind of like take care of me a lot and stuff like that. So, uh, growing up, I always felt like that, um, the environment that I was in was not actually reflecting on what, um, real life was going to be like. Um, so I, I guess left uni in an endeavor to experience what life was like and try and make something for myself. Um, so in that I went to do door to door for the first time. That was kind of like my first job that I did. Uh, basically just knocking doors, try to sell like, home phone, internet, like that kind of stuff. Uh, I actually wasn't that good. So <laughs> um, that was kind of like the first, the first humbling experience that I had. Um, but from that, that's what uh, I got into like a lot of personal development from that because I wanted to get better as a salesperson because so, I wasn't making any sales. Um, and 
yeah, that led to going to events, like, you know, going to like, you know, Tony Robbins, like doing a lot of, lot of different events um, for a while. And that's how I really got into the personal development mindset stuff. Um, they really started to see the value of that over the actual skill part that your attitude and your thoughts kind of overridden a lot of the skills that, that people, people had. Obviously, the skills are important, but um, if someone had a better attitude, um, they could overtake someone with better skills at some point if they just kept that. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay, so you start, you know, the, the door-to-door sales and everything. Yeah. You start learning about mindset. So how long did you stay in the door-to-door sales? Did you, was it just kind of a brief thing or what, what did you do? Uh, how long, that, about how long did you stay and what did you do after? A year and a half. Uh, so it wasn't that for a year and a half. Like, cause basically I wanted to get in that to like learn how to like talk to people and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, build my confidence cause I was pretty shy back then. Um, then from there, like I got into, did a lot of like tele- telephone sales. So I was in the sales industry for, for a very long time. Um, but yeah, that's what, that's where I went to. Awesome. So, all right. So about 10 years ago then, is when you start getting to mindset and everything. So yeah. now, cor- correct me if I'm wrong, but now you're you're trying to use that that knowledge, those those skills that you learned, to try to help other people you know, develop their mindset, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. So absolutely. Um, so I, I'm just curious. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what what are you doing right okay. now to I guess to to help others in in that area? Um. So basically, like, obviously, the content stuff is a mm-hmm. is a big thing like um to so the reason why i got into the content thing was actually threefold there's um through the process of actually going through all the events and stuff uh what i was finding that was that a lot of them had these almost like these transformational processes that people go through in a very short period of time that could really shift their belief system uh really shift a lot of the the stuff that has been instilled in them um from when they're growing up so Uh, For example, like one of the events was an event called Millionaire Mind Intensive, where it actually shifts people's beliefs around their relationship with money, specifically, because it was a financial thing. Um, And a lot of people have these beliefs where like, um, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, things like they they don't have a good relationship with that. And a lot of those belief systems were instilled by, you know, the parents, um, things that the parents consistently tell them or people that they model, um, people they look up to, society, their friends and stuff like that. So we have a lot of these patterns that are there that um, are kind of operating our life. And there's a lot of these processes that you can go through that you go back and you actually release a lot of those patterns and you can rewrite them with something that you actually want. So that's uh, that's what the focus has been more on towards. So the reason why I started doing the content was that, um, I wanted to get a little bit more of that stuff out there, obviously through almost like a drip feed system where like, you know, every day you drop just a little bit. If someone shifts their focus just a little bit every single day over the course of like one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 years, it's going to change their whole perspective of how, where they were 10 years ago to how they perceive the world now. And that is going to have a really big impact on what they actually do and how that manifests in their behavior. Um, so there was that. Um, also at some point I do want to, I guess do like, you know, like personal coaching one-on-ones and get that kind of stuff out there. Uh, really work with people individually to, to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean like that's, that's where it's at. Awesome. So in your own personal experience, personal journey, how would you say your own mindset has changed over the last 10 years? Yep. Uh, so what do you think you've, you've done over the last 10 years to, to help change your or help shift your own your own mindset hey uh i'm sorry i just kind of like lagged out a bit <laughs> okay you okay. hear me uh yeah i missed the last button sorry okay no you're good you're good yeah. try and reach you in australia <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i was asking so uh, over the last 10 years what have you personally done to to help shift your mindset uh personally yeah uh oof. that's interesting okay so there's been a lot of um uh obviously through like the events and stuff like that you go through like a lot of the processes um there was a couple that i picked up along the way which 
um, that people can do themselves. Um, there's one called EFT or emotional freedom technique that really, that really made a big difference uh, to me when I was going through that. Um, and also when I was going through the skin stuff, it, it really helped a lot. Cause um, the issue is that well, a lot of the challenges, I think, in my opinion, I'm like could be wrong, but um, a lot of the challenges is that when people want to make a positive change, that they've been in such a negative space for so long, like habitually that when they think about something positive, it's so far away from where they, they've been for so long that there's, when they try to think about being positive, it's, it's, it's almost like they, they think they're lying to themselves in a sense. Like it feels like it's fake positivity or like, you know, they just kind of like, it's just like fluff in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is that you're, have, if you're habitually thinking in a certain way for so long and you try to go for this like way extreme uh, perspective, it's too much of a jump. So when people try to do that, they actually think that they're actually lying to themselves. So I'll give you an example with this. It's like if you go to the gym and um, if you haven't been to the gym ever and you're like, I don't know, say for example, like 250 pounds or like 300 pounds or something like that. And you go to the gym for the first time and you want to run like 10 Ks. It's pretty hard to actually do that on the first run. I'm not saying that you can't do that, but it's, it's really hard to go just first day, just go in and hit that 10 K run straight away. Um, it's, that's kind of like what it's like. So like if you've been in a negative space for so long, it's going to take some time to get you to be able to shift that. Now what the EFT does is it allows you to let go of the negative charge that's attached to the um or the negative emotional attachment that you have to thinking in that way so that you have the ability to actually reach out to think about the positive self and that's one of the challenges that i think a lot of people have when they when they're in like anxiety or like they're they're trying to be more positive is that they've had all these patterns of negativity that they keep getting drawn their thoughts keep getting drawn back to being more negative and being more negative. Every time they try to reach for a positive thought, it's just so foreign to them that they keep drawing back to the negative one. So that's what the, the process does. It allows you to get out of that um, so that you can think about the positive stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause yeah, when it's off, like you were saying, when people, they try making a, a shift, like maybe thinking more positively or maybe thinking, oh yeah, I can do this. There's just that yeah. old, basically that old uh, wiring, that old conditioning. Yeah, for sure. You're basically the subconscious part of your mind is going to tell you all the reasons why you can't or why you exactly yeah that way yeah 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 it's all there man like it's just it's just sitting there underneath like but everybody has it you know so it's it's yeah that's what it's like <laughs> yeah it's just I don't know, it's just so interesting i i really do love learning about and like talking about i guess the, like the brain and how all the, the mind works and everything uh, yeah, yeah. cuz i mean it's interesting cuz the the brain is just an organ yeah. Like it, it, that it's part of our body. It's, it's, it's all it's really doing is it's function, you know, but we, it's, yeah. it's really depends on what we've been putting in there. And like, I think like you were saying earlier, like the, the programming, the beliefs that's been put into us since we were, you know, a child. Yeah. So I, I guess on that note, how I, what, what was your childhood like? Like, did your parents ever talk about this kind of stuff? Was it? Oh, no, ever, no. No. <laughs> No nah, man, like my parents, um, they actually immigrated. They actually immigrated here from, um, uh, from Vietnam. So they they came from like during the war period of time. Um, so during the war, like there was a lot of like people that left Vietnam because obviously they want to be in the war. Um, so a lot of them migrated to like the U.S. and like Australia. They were kind of like the two main ones. Um, so my parents came here, and I guess I'll be like the first generation after that. Um, so actually. This actually is, is good. It goes ties into what, what what I found from like a lot of the seminars and stuff was that I didn't realize it at the time, but a lot of the patterning that came from being being exposed to the war stuff from my parents that actually got passed down, and a lot of the thought processes that were there got passed down. I didn't realize that that was actually a thing until I started going to some of the stuff, and it's like, oh, where did this where does this belief come from? And it's like, oh, it must have came from this, and it must have came from that, you know, and having them. And their experience, obviously, when they came here, they didn't know English. So it wasn't as multicultural as it was back then. So obviously, they had a lot of issues like, you know, fitting in and like, you know, being in the community and stuff like that. 
Um, so there was a little, little bit of negativity and a lot of beliefs that were created around that um, when they were kind of like finding their way in a sense. And some of that stuff gets passed down. Like, and I, and I started to realize that, hey, there's actually a big issue here that, um, that a lot of people aren't, they might not know that that's what's happening or like that they created that belief or whatever it is. But that belief is still operating in their life and it's still, you know, affecting them today. And there's a lot of families that, that are like that, that come from the war and stuff like that. Maybe not just the Vietnam War, but like other wars. There's a lot of like trauma and stuff that gets passed down. Um, and it does, it does affect how the next generation is going to be um, just based on how they bring you up. Um, the, the lessons that they teach you, you know, like um, it's, really, it's really intricate. It's, it's really interesting like how that unfolded. And um, I feel that our generation um, is, has a lot of the residual effects of that stuff that's still kind of just there that they haven't really thought about yet, but it's, it's actually there. Like it's actually there. And when you really ask the right questions, you can actually pull out a lot of that stuff and you can see it trigger and stuff like that. It's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause well, well, I'm not quite sure the case in your, you know, with your yeah, yeah. and everything, but I mean, what, I, yeah, it's just so interesting thing. Like, you know, someone's been through a war, you know, there might be certain beliefs that are handed down. They may not be the, the healthiest the best beliefs at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know but it's what they used to kind of su survive almost like. Yeah. That. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it was what they needed at the time. Needed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's no judgment on like what that belief is. It's oh, just they sure. needed that at the time, you know? For sure. I, yeah. I think it's just the, uh, important to have, have that awareness that, you know, they yeah. think this way because this, like you were saying, that's what they need at that time. Yeah. You know, I think that it's good to have that, I guess for people to have to have those conversations so they can have that empathy, you know? Yeah. Then, you know, you know, grandma thinks this way because, you know, she, when she was, yeah, yeah. Age, she had to, you know, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> take care of the whole family and, you know, do all for this sure. stuff and dodge bullets and, you, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. That, that's so, but it does, give, it does give you more like, um, like it does give you more compassion for like some of the stuff that you have. And some of the other people and some of the issues that they have. And also, like, um, I guess it, it makes you a little bit more grateful for some of the experiences. I mean, even, like, with this coronavirus thing, like, um, at least it's not, there's no war happening right now. Yeah. Not, not, not to my knowledge, anyway. Like, like for where we are, like, we're still pretty, you know, we can still go to the store. Uh, we can still get food. Like, there's no shortage of food. Um, obviously, like, there's people, like, stocking up on stuff. But, um, you, know, you know, we still have food for, like, at least, like, two, three months, at least. Right? Um, so our freedoms aren't, you know, aren't shut down or anything like that. So, you know, we can still do stuff. We still have the internet, which is really cool. So yeah. it's, it's different. And like, so and then, so with all that in mind, what, I guess, what advice would you give? Let's say there's, I don't know, eight, 17 year old living in Tennessee, you know, okay. they, they, maybe they're like, <laughs> someone who's grown up maybe in an environment where you know the the belief system is not may not might, might not be the best you know mm -hmm. may not be, might not be the healthiest what advice would you give to someone i guess to help them or what advice would you give to someone um to help them start changing their mindset to help help them start becoming aware of and changing the beliefs that aren't serving them I think the most important thing is, um, and obviously like, you know, Gary Vee talks about humility a lot. Um, it really is the starting point for everything like, uh, humility, self-awareness. There's also like another way to say it would be, um, you just gotta be willing to, to look, to be honest with yourself. Um, probably honest with yourself more so than anything else like that. That is really hard. You know, people can be honest with other people, but to really be honest with yourself, and how you really feel and how you really think, um, that is really hard to do, I think, because I think people just don't like the responsibility of if you've done something that you know has created a certain result that is probably not good for you, you kind of don't want to look at that. Like, there's always that. You always want to downplay it. But when you, when you actually expose yourself, like, internally, um, to yourself like you don't have to tell anyone else but if you actually go like deep within yourself and you actually is this really the case am i really like this do i really do this 
you know, and these results in my life, am I really causing that? And you actually access that, then that actually allows you the ability to change that. Um, what a lot of people do is if they ignore that and they push it away, they go, oh, it's not me or it's someone else or this other thing happened. Then you kind of lose control over the ability to be able to change that because it's not your fault. If you take responsibility for all the stuff that you do, whether it's good or bad, even if it's bad, like if you just take responsibility for that, then you now have the ability to go, okay, if I created this, now I can change it to create something else because I'm in control over it. And that's, that's kind of like the really big thing. Um, and it takes a little bit of time to actually be able to go and do that because we may have been in a space where we haven't taken control over those things or we haven't been responsible for the things in our life for so long. And almost like going to the gym, if we haven't been responsible for all the things in our life for so long, it's like going to the gym for the first time, you know, trying to take responsibility for everything for the first time is really, really hard to do. So you've got to kind of do it like a little bit at a time. And I think that's probably the, the biggest thing is being honest with yourself um, and just being okay with it taking a little bit longer and just understanding that, okay, I'm right here right now. Obviously I want to go there, but it, there's a process that takes, there's a process that, that you need to go through in order to get there. Like it's not going to happen in one day. So just going through that day by day is, is a really important thing. Yeah, for sure. You gotta, it's definitely a process. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially when it comes to like, like the mind and everything that, I mean, we're talking about yeah. 15, 20, some cases, 60 years. Yeah. Years worth of, of belief you know, patterning and stuff. Yeah. Well, the good news is that your mind can change really fast. You know, um, if you have enough, intensity of emotion you can really shift your thought process very fast a lot faster than you can shift your muscles like if you spent like if you went to the if you went to the gym every single day for a whole year and you grind it like every day um you would get to a certain level right but if you did the same level of thought and effort with your mind you could get to a way different level than if you just went to the gym and the, the amount of growth that you'll get in the muscle but the amount of growth you can get in your mindset during that period of time is just like exponentially greater it's it's really fast to shift that uh but you still need to take time to go through it you know yeah for sure so i guess with that with that said actually i think i answered my own question in my head but i, I, want, <laughs> I want to get your, your perspective on it though then w since the mind can change and it can change mm. relatively quick i mean we i mean there are some people change extremely quick but wh yeah. why do you think why do you think there are some people who don't believe they can change? Oh, that's a good question, actually. That's a really good question. Um, if you have established the belief in yourself, or if you have been told and you've taken on the belief that you, that you are going to be like this and you cannot change or that you're not good enough or that any, any, what, any type of belief that kind of basically keeps you stuck, that is something that you you are actually thinking about subconsciously all the time, which means that you actually believe in that, and therefore you are also creating that in your life. So, a lot of the stuff is we're always in the process of creating something. We're always in the process of making something happen, and that is either in a positive motion forward or just like basically standing still. And standing still is actually going backwards. You actually not you actually can't stand still because time is always moving forward. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of time is that people have those beliefs that counteract the positive motion forward, which means that they get stuck there. And if they keep dwelling on that and they keep um, almost like entertaining that thought, then they continue to build a stronger and stronger and stronger habit around that thought process, which continues to make them even more stuck. So that's kind of the root, one of the root causes of, of that. Like if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. So then... Again, what, what advice would you give to someone who maybe wants to start changing, but they've been in an environment where people have to constantly told them that they can't change? Yeah. Uh, again, it's, re it's realizing that, um, number one, being aware that that's the case, that, okay, maybe I have established that, uh, this belief pattern. Uh, number two is, would be to take responsibility for that. You know, um, the initial thought that I have is that if someone realizes that they're in that position, the first thing that I would think about is, um, oh, well, if my parents had told me this, then that's their fault. You know, they start to blame like external circumstances. Um, so what would be important would be to realize that, okay, they may have, I may have been brought up in this environment. I may have been told these things, 
but to take the responsibility to know that you have taken that thought on and then you yourself have actually pondered on that and you believe that that is creating a reality. When you take the responsibility that you have actually taken on that thought and then you create it yourself, then you have the ability to change that. Until you make that step, it's really hard to, to do that because you're always going to be blaming someone else for that thought being put into you rather than you going, okay, I actually accepted this thought from someone else and I actually agreed with them and thus thought of myself. Now I'm in this position because when you do that, then you're okay. Now I can change it because now that I've created this for myself, I can now create something else that I want because I also created that. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so interesting how when you take responsibility for yourself, you know, for your life, you yeah. obviously can't control what other people did, what other people said, but you know, when you start, I guess, basically more owning yourself, owning yeah. your life, like it, it actually, for me, when I, I mean, I'm still working on that. I, I realize that I still yeah, have yeah. some, some things I'm always working on. Work on. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, when I started doing that, I know in my life, like it just led to a lot more like freedom. Like I felt a lot free, yeah. a lot more, a lot happier. Cause yeah. like I can't blame anyone else. Like that's, it's on me. And that, that's actually, I feel like that's freeing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's actually, it's funny. Cause like when you're, when you're not in that, that place, thinking about taking responsibility for stuff feels like counterintuitive. It's like, no, but if I take responsibility for that, then I actually feel like I'll be more in prison, but it's actually the opposite effect. Like when you do that, then it's like, no, it's actually better. Like it's, it's really weird. Like, <laughs> like I, I can understand why people don't want to do that. Like that's, yeah, that's where I go with that. Yeah, it's just funny because I think we, oftentimes we, I guess we, we create our own like self-made prisons in our minds. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So shifting slightly, how, mm. how important is gratitude for you in your life? I think it's really important um, because for, uh, especially when you're going through like really tough times, like, especially if, you, if you're like in the midst of something really tough, like whether it's financially health or whatever it is, gratitude is actually the fastest way to get out of that. You know how, like, um, you know, how I was saying before, like the thought of trying to reach for something really positive is, is, is really hard. Um, if you're focused on something that like that you can be grateful, thankful and appreciative for, that's actually the fastest way to be able to shift that thought process and to really build up the positive habit because even if you're in the most negative, negative, negative of, of, of things, you always have something to be grateful for. Like always, like wherever you are, even if you're in war, you could be like grateful for that you're still alive at that moment in time. So at any moment in time, moment, moment to moment, like step by step, you always can have something to be grateful for. You always can have something to be thankful for. You always can have something to be appreciative for. You might not see it straight away, but you have to, if you keep asking the question, you know, what can I be grateful for? What can I be thankful for? You're eventually going to find something. And when you find something, that thought is actually a positive thought, which means that it actually gets you to focus on that more. So you start building the habit of, you know, thinking more positive. It's like doing, um, it's like doing push-ups, you know, it's like a, it's like one rep of your push-up. So you're just going to keep, you're just going to keep doing it until it becomes like really, really strong. And then you eventually do it automatically. And when you can do it automatically, then your life, you won't feel as negative anymore. If not, you won't even experience negativity because everything that you have, you will automatically default to gratitude. You automatically default to thankfulness. You automatically default to appreciate. So if a negative thing happens to you, you automatically, what am I grateful for from this situation? And if you think about that, that's the best kind of, it's kind of like the best kind of um, way to live because you don't have any fear of anything bad happening to you. Because if something quote bad does happen to you, you automatically default into gratitude. Like it's just you're not scared of anything. It's really cool way to live. Like <laughs> for sure, yeah. Gratitude has actually been something I've been trying to focus on a little more lately. And yeah. As I've done that, uh, I don't know if you've experienced this as well, but as I've done that, it's Okay, well, let me take a step back real quick. So I feel okay, like okay. sometimes when we talk about gratitude, it's more like, you know, what are you thankful for? You know, list everything, which was, isn't yeah. bad. That's not yeah, bad. Yeah. But I feel like as I've been focusing more on gratitude, it's like, I don't know, it's almost like gratitude is more, it's not, it's not so much an intellectual thing as much as uh, an emotional, like, 
maybe even you could say mm. spiritual thing. Yeah. Like, like for, I don't know, just like the other day, I, I was just looking at my daughter and I can say I'm grateful for her, but it's, yeah. it's hard to describe the actual like feeling of gratitude. Feeling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, like, and like when you feel that, like when you start having that more in your life, it just it just puts things in perspective. Like it's, it's hard to yeah. even be upset with, you know, having to stay home or yeah, yeah. running out of toilet paper or whatever is happening in your life. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the toilet paper thing is about, but <laughs> <laughs> we have the same issue. We're running out of toilet paper as well, so we. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. But uh, yeah, I completely agree, man. Like, I think, like your thinking and your emotions are really interconnected, um, and also like your spiritual, your spiritual part of yourself is interconnected to that as well. You know, um, yeah. I don't have a daughter, so I can't, I can't, I can't relate to that. Yeah. So <laughs> no worries. Right. one day, one day. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> how many kids do you have? Uh, so I have uh, one daughter. Well, I have one and I have one daughter who's born and then another daughter on the okay. way. Oh, wow. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to shift, uh, shift topics again real quick. Okay. So I know you're into reselling. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, how did you get started in that? Uh, Gary P was the the main proponent for that. Um, but I was working in retail at the time, and uh, obviously I was looking at like business and trying to find an extra income. Um, so there was this one thing I did want to start, but I was like, hey, I can't really afford that right now. So how do I make money from nothing? And a lot of the things that I've looked at the, in the past, you have to like invest like you know thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or whatever. And it's like, well, I don't really have that right now, so. How do I, I have 20 bucks right now? How do I use that to, you know, make something happen? And then I started watching like Gary Vee stuff. You know, his trash talks was really, really interesting to me. Um, and I always knew that flipping was a thing. But because of my self-imposed belief that I didn't know how to use eBay and I didn't know much about shipping, I just like never did it for like a long time. And after watching his trash talk stuff, I was like, Hey, that actually looks pretty easy. So like, why don't I just go and try it? And then we went to a, uh, went to a garage sale for the first time, spent like 25 bucks, bought up a bunch of stuff and I put it up on eBay and then like I left it there cause I didn't know if it was going to work. Three weeks later, um, one of the items sold for like 50 bucks and I was like, holy shit, like it actually, <laughs> actually works. Right. Um, it was like some leather bag or something. We bought for like $7. It was, it was actually really good. Um, and then we bought these other like teacup things as well. It was like a set of six. Uh, we bought for like total. This is a bad buy, but um, I, I put them up as well. And I was like, dude, no one's ever going to buy this. And like a week later after the bag sold, like those sold as well for like 35. I was like, okay, like maybe this is the thing. Yeah, so then I just took that money that I made and just like went out to another garage show and just bought more stuff. And then it just kind of like, like uh, started to snowball from there. Which is really cool. That's cool. It's interesting. Uh, about about your story with with the reselling, how you knew it was a thing. Mm. Yeah, um, and I hadn't really thought about this too much, but you know, you said that you started doing it because of uh, Gary Vee. You saw him do it. Yeah, I don't know, which kind of makes me think of. I don't know. I think sometimes we know something might be good. Yeah, um, but we just need someone to, I guess, kind of show us. You show know? you. We yeah, someone. We need. Um, I guess someone put out some content. You know, just to yeah. help shift our our perspective. You know. Mm. yeah absolutely i think that um seeing it happen builds the belief and when you when you believe in something you actually do it like that's uh i think i think that's what 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 the challenge is for like actually taking action is like whether you believe in that it's going to work and then whether you believe that you can do it like those are like the two main two main things when you see someone else do it that you see that has been in the same position as you and it's like, oh, hey, that guy was, is just like me and he's doing it and he can do it. Then it gives you the belief that you can do it and then you can actually start doing that. I think when that, you hit like, kind of like that tipping point of like, all right, I actually believe that this is going to work. That's when you actually take the action. And there's no, almost like no hold back or no reservations that like, uh, I don't know if it's going to work and all that kind of stuff. Like still there's some of that there because you haven't done it before. But um, I think when you see someone else do it, it's, it's really, really big thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I think that's what happened. Like, so I'm curious, what's uh, what's been some, one of your best flips so far? 
one of my best flips. Oh, dude, I got stories. I got so many stories for the flip stuff. It's crazy, man. Like, so I'll give you, I'll give you three. I'll give you three. Okay. So like the first one was, um, the, my biggest, my best flip was basically on the, on this one day, I went to two garage sales, which are really close together. The first day, uh, the first one, uh, actually they were, both the people were in the same situation. So they were living in a house and they literally bought a new house already. Um, and they still had stuff in their old house, which they had to like get rid of because they literally sold their house already. Um, so these guys had like, um, they, they had to give the keys in the next day. Uh, and they still had heaps of stuff in their garage. So I rocked up and, um, they had these Beatles, like Franklin mint memorabilia stuff. Um, there was like Beatles, VHS, some book ends, like, you know, the stuff that you put on the bookshelf to that that goes between the books. Um, so I was like, Hey, how much, how much are you guys going to do for the Beatles stuff? And the wife was like, you know, I've been collecting for like 20 years. Like these, you can't get these anymore. Um, I was like, well, I'm gonna be honest. I only have like 25 bucks on me right now. Would you do it for 25? And she's like, all right, yeah, sure. So she, she gave it to me for 25 and then I actually didn't post it up for a long time, but I finally put it up. Um, and the Franklin mints, I got like six of them. I sold five of them for 700. <laughs> yeah, 700. So after the shipping, the fees, I bought insurance as well because I, because they're really, they're really fragile. Um, so after the fees and stuff, like net net was like 595. <laughs> yeah. And then we still have, we still have more of the other Beatles stuff from that $25 that we spent. So like, some of the other stuff, like I see what one of the globes, one of the globes was trying to sell for like another like 120. Um, but there was this other little statue thing that came with it. I sold that for about 85 the other day. And then the bookends are about hundred, hundred ish each. If I, if I do that, but like, I don't know, man, like that's, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Like, that sounds like a very good $25 invested. <laughs> it was the, 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 actually the, the same on the same day. Um, so this is the, goes back to the second one. Um, so on the same day we went into this other house and they have the old VHS tapes, like, you know, like the, the old cassette tapes yeah. and they have like these big boxes, like, like big boxes, about like 20, 25 of like VHSs in each of them. And I looked it up on the spot and I saw one of the VHSs sell for like $15. I was like, okay. Um, and they were literally selling the boxes, like the big boxes for like 15 each. And they had like five of them. And I was like, uh, well, obviously I don't think these guys are going to sell the VHS tapes to anyone anytime soon. So I was like, uh, would you guys take all of them for $10? And they're like, sure. So they, they, <laughs> they gave me like, they gave me all five boxes of these VHS. We got like 120, 125 of them for like 10 bucks. And I put one of them up and it sold in like two hours for like $15. So like, for some reason, I don't know why they just, they've just been slowly selling. It's really crazy. Like, I think we made about like 300, 350 from that, that, that whole box Dang. of just like slowly selling VHSs. Um, so that's the second story. The third one is actually really cool. So the third one is, um, I don't know if you guys have this, but, um, we have these things called community pickup days. So that's when, um, when the council in the area, um, basically they, it's kind of like a county, um, but they basically come around and pick up your trash like that you have in your house. So the stuff that you really want to get rid of that you don't, um, that you can't get rid of normally. So things like, you know, fridges, like, you know, all these like big items and stuff like that um, that you can't just like throw away in the rubbish. So they actually have a day where you put all the stuff that you don't want in your house out on the street and then they come around and pick it up. So on this day, we were just in the area of this um, suburb and we're like, hey, this is like, there's like all this stuff in the street. So this was about like, uh, I think about two months in. So I was like, Hey, why don't we just go around and check around and see if they have some good stuff. Um, there's this one person's house. They left like a big box of like uni law textbooks for like college and university and stuff like that in there. Um, it was really heavy. It was about like 25 kilos or something. So we picked up the whole box and uh, we started selling the textbooks online and we sold like four of them for like 68 bucks each. And then, one of inside the box they also have like novels and stuff that they wanted to get rid of inside one of the novels there was a hundred dollar us bill in there like lodged as a bookmark in the novel so i wanted to go exchange it it was about 140 i got about 140 like australian for it but it was just like out on the street so 
a lot of that stuff was like I didn't pay for it. Like they were gonna throw it out anyway when the council was gonna come and like chuck it. So I don't know, it's crazy. Like like those are the three the three main the three main flips that I got that really were shows that the opportunity is really out there if you're really gonna look for it. Yeah, for sure, for sure, man. Like people are literally people are literally throwing money outside. Yeah, like <laughs> the guy literally threw a hundred bucks out. I'm like, oh man. Like, Dude, that's crazy. Oh my gosh. So, how long how long have you been flipping for? Like uh since August. Oh really? Yeah. Do you do uh do you do cards as well or uh yeah, so more recently I've been getting into like I've always loved uh, Pokemon. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I I'm more big into like Pokemon cards. Right now I haven't been flipping as many as much as I've just been okay. buying a few to hold on to. Okay. What's um what's a what's a couple of good ones? Because I haven't really looked into it. Like I used to I used to collect a lot of Pokemon cards like a long, long time ago. Oh gosh. Dude, that's like the question I get asked the most. So <laughs> um if you're looking for like a flip, like to flip anything pretty quickly, yeah. uh look into the it's called full art shining Charizard. Full art shining. I'm gonna write this down. <laughs> yeah, and the it's the the rainbow one. Okay. Is there only one card or like uh, be so yeah, so that, that one that one is a uh, it's it's a real rel- relatively new. I think it came out in twenty eighteen. I don't remember. Oh year. really? Yeah, so it's a newer one. Uh, yeah, but yeah. You, can usually, you can usually buy them on eBay, like win, win them in an au- in auction for like three, four hundred dollars, and then yeah. if you hold on to it for like a month or so, you can easily flip it for like. I've seen people flip them for like twelve hundred. Oh really? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so though that um, I haven't seen too many auctions for them lately, like as much okay. not as much as as like three or four months ago. But yeah, yeah. If, if you can get one for a few hundred dollars, dude, like good that, yeah. that's that's gonna be a flip um as far as anything like investing or anything long term like mm. every single series has their own rare cards okay um and so i, I would look at like uh, charizard is like almost always like a go-to Charizard's the OG, <laughs> Charizard's <man. almost> hot. <laughs> okay okay um but like i would seriously like look up like every series of pokemon cards okay. and then see like what are the rarest ones in those ones and look for those ones um, okay. So the ones that came out recently, like there's a Sword and Shield that came out recently. Um, they have like the V, what's called V and V Max cards. Those ones are the rarest ones in those sets. Mm. Um, well, yeah, if you look into those ones, and, like, and especially if you're looking to like cards that are graded, like you can usually get some of those for like 20, 30, 40 bucks. And if you're going to like invest, like you want to hold on to them for a few years, I yeah. almost guarantee every single one of those are going to go up to like 200, 300. 100. Oh, really? Yeah. What what drives the demand for the Pokemon cards? Like So it's like it's like anything supply and demand. So yeah. it, it's just, it's the, like fact, just the fact that the, the V, so the like they're called V cards and V Max, they're just yeah. they only make so many. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So yeah. So I mean mm-hmm. just, that 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 those are my two cents on that. Okay, okay. I'll look into it. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Like uh, like there are other cards, I mean there's if you're looking for like more rare cards, I would look up uh, Neo Genesis cards, uh, rare cards from Neo Genesis that series. Oh yeah. Or Neo Destiny. Okay. Because I'm not quite sure why. Uh, uh, I've been trying to figure this out. I can't find any good answer for it. But I think okay. that those two series, they, I think they just made a limited amount in general, or maybe just all the kids uh, yeah. who got them like lost them i don't know <laughs> but yeah <laughs> there, there's a pretty limited amount of those cards especially okay cards. so those those cards are are, are they're they're pretty hot they're they're pretty hot like when if you can get some, okay. some, some of the it's all like the shadow shadowless shadowless cards were like fully expensive Gosh, like it was like they, like a don't even give me, don't rare me start on the shadowless <laughs> yeah yeah because dude uh, okay I, I literally saw just a, a few a few weeks ago, a first yeah. edition Shadowless. I think it was a, a PSA ten Charizard. Oh, nice! Uh, yeah. That went for a quarter million dollars. That's crazy, man. Yeah, like oh my, <laughs> that, that's crazy. Pokemon, man. Like I'm. That's how I'm gonna <laughs> pay for my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good. 
I got into basketball cards like pretty heavy. Like uh, Pokemon's pretty cool as well. So. So are you doing like when you're doing basketball cards? Are you doing like NBA, or what? Yeah, yeah. Uh so I've been collecting a lot of like Kobe Kobe cards. Um, or personal collection as as well actually, um, because I, I really like Kobe. Um, there's Kevin Durant, Steph, Steph Curry, and um, I got uh, some Carmelo Anthony as well. That's uh, a lot of the stuff is like long term, long term yeah. holds. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, especially, I mean, with the NBA season being canceled, it's kind of the price yeah. they, have, they have, they have. I'm, I'm a little bit sour that I don't have enough, like, capital to, like, just go and buy some stuff, but. <laughs> just just <laughs> go find thing. more stuff on the street. Yeah, I know, man. More $100 bills. <laughs> Coronavirus, don't go out, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, can't go out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, hey, have you been able to, uh, like, I don't know how often you resell, like, how, yeah. how big of it, how big you're into it. Yeah, yeah. With with like everyone having to stay inside, like mm. how has that affected your ability to resell? Um, not not much actually. I just sold a bunch of stuff like today, which is pretty interesting. Puzzles are really hot right now. So if you have any puzzle boxes or you have like any like at home games like Monopoly, like that stuff like went out so fast. I li- I listed like eight puzzle boxes like yesterday. I sold like seven of them already. Oh wow, which is crazy. Oh. Yeah, like it just sold like really fast. Um. So if you have any puzzle boxes lying around the house, you, you should put them up. <laughs> um, but in terms of reselling, so I haven't really been sourcing because obviously you can't go out. Um, and obviously the op shops probably is not the best place to be. Um, but before the whole thing went down, we actually bought up a lot of um, um, my, <laughs> my missus at the time. So she, she, found, she found a really good deal at uh, one of the, I don't know if you guys have, you guys have like department stores, right? Like in uh, in in the US, right? Like you guys got um, TJ, not TK Maxx, TJ Maxx, TJ Maxx, yeah. Uh, what other ones do you have? Like Ross, Ross, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have we have something like that. So we have this thing called David Jones, and um, they were doing a one dollar rack for like actual designer label items, like with the tag still on them. <laughs> Yeah, so we we went in and we like we didn't know it was legit. So she went and she bought like eight items like the day before, and I was like, oh, they actually charged me like eight dollars for like eight items. So I was like, okay. So when we went in the next day, and we bought up like eighty items, like some of the some of the jeans and stuff. Like um, I think there's one that's like Good American. I don't know if you know the brand. Yeah. Good American jeans like retailed at like two two ninety five or something like that. We bought it for a dollar. There's like there's j brand beckham bridge like we got a lot of like australian designer stuff um a lot of like swimmer apparel as well like all of them still have the tags on it uh swimmer is not that hot right now because we're going into winter but it's probably good for summer but we still have like like tons of stuff that we're just like it's listed up but we're going to like go through some of it uh on top of the inventory that i picked up from all the shops and stuff like over the last couple months so we just kind of, kind of um, sit on that stuff because there's still a lot there. Like, yeah, so it's been doing alright. That's good. Yeah, it's good to have inventory like already. In there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really thankful we had that. Otherwise, we'd be pretty screwed right now. But <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, uh, just go ask a couple more questions, and we'll wrap this up. Yeah, sure. No worries, man. So, um, so with reselling. I heard some yeah. of your best flips. I'm curious. Have you had any like major flops or just like? Should not have bought that. Any any like mistakes or that you've made so far in reselling? That is, yeah, <laughs> quite a few of those. I'm trying to think about which one's good, which is not good. Um, there's a bunch of uh, what's not good. There's there's a bunch of stuff that I bought. Oh, okay, yeah. So TK Maxx. So there's one. There's a couple from TK Maxx that I bought. So I bought the, like this um, uh, Herschel's bag that. I think I paid too much for it. It was like 30, 31 or something like that. Um, I saw it like selling online for like 70 bucks. Um, but for some reason it's been maybe like four or five months now. It hasn't sold, but it has like so many, it has so many like views. It got to like a thousand five hundred views with like no watches, which is really weird. And like, I don't know, just some of the stuff that I tried to do, like retail arbitrage. Um, I realized that I paid too much for the item um and it doesn't flip as fast so you kind of lock up your cash a bit more 
like I bought like this Lego thing for like 180 and I think I only made like 20 bucks profit on it. So a lot of that stuff is, is good if you start to build up more cash flow. Um, but I think when, when starting off, like, like, cause I was like starting off, um, it's better to just stick to the garage sale and like op shops because garage sale stuff is just so cheap. Like so much more value in there. But yeah, those are some of my stuff. Cool, man. Well, last question for you. Wow, what brings you happiness? Well, what makes you happy? Um, I think seeing other people achieve their goals. Like that that has always been like a main thing for me. Like whether it's whether it's through me or through something else, but like seeing other people like actually work towards something like for a very long time. Like, say if they have like a goal or a dream that they really want um, and they've been working at it for maybe like two years, three years, four years, or they're, they're really going for it. That moment when they actually achieve that um, is really cool. Like, like I've seen that it's almost like that breakthrough moment when someone has, when they really overcome something that's really challenging or like they achieve something that's really cool. There's something in that moment that, that is really, really cool to see. Um, and I've been really privileged to be able to see some people go through that experience. Um, and a lot of the stuff I want to create is to be able to create those experiences for other people so help them achieve the things that they want or help them overcome the challenges that they have. Just that moment is like, I don't know, I don't know something about that. Like, that's what makes me happy. Like, I like seeing that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I think that, uh, that, that definitely reflects in you because definitely what i've seen like on social media like just very supportive you know just very uh yeah i think that that just you you live that so i'm, I'm that does not surprise Appreciate me that, man. that's your answer <laughs> so real quick um i really think you guys should come you guys should follow this guy on, on social media you just get to connect with him where can they find you How uh can connect with you uh so got instagram uh, Twitter, kind of have YouTube, not really. I need to put more into that. TikTok, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Snapchat. Uh, most of the handles that I have is like James underscore A underscore T double E. That's, I kind of use that for like everything. So just look for that and you'll be able to find me. But yeah. All right. Perfect, man. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Dude, this was fun. Yeah, it's good. I should do more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Again, thanks so much for having you on. That's all right. Appreciate your time, yeah.